Good morning, everybody. We're so happy that you could come and worship with us this morning. Let's stand together and sing.
All right, we talked to this last week. We hope you sing with us. And breaking through the silence with glory in the highest, the hope of all creation, resting in his mother's arms. The sun on the horizon. Ringing through the heavens, the long awaited Savior come to set the captives free. Oh, come to set the captives free, come and set us free. Come on, we sing. Believer Church, y'all can take a couple, take a seat for a couple minutes. Uh, my name is Tyler. I'm the Next Steps Pastor here, and I just want to say welcome, welcome, welcome. Thank you so much for being here this morning, especially if you are a first-time guest, because I know taking that first step to a new church can be tough. So again, thank you for being here this morning. And if you were either given a communication card or if you have your cell phone out, could you pull it out and scan that QR code there? Because we want to get connected with you. That is a way that you can give us prayer requests. You can let us know any way you want to get plugged in, whether it's a B group or an impact team, anything like that. All that information comes to me, and then I help you do my best to get you plugged in, however, wherever you want to be plugged in as well. And also, please, write your prayer request here too, because we want to be praying with you and for you, and we kind of can't do that if we don't know what to pray for, because we want to be specific. So please, in addition to that as well, if you're a first-time guest, Check that first time guest box and then you can go out to Connect Central with the big blue sign and then we have some of the greatest Christian chicken waiting for you. A coupon actually. The sandwiches are not out there right now. We have coupons for you. So please take those and then go to Chick-fil-A and get your stuff. So it's all good. Truly appreciate that. 
Uh, also, as well, we are, I think we're still in the Christmas season because I see the reefs, I saw the trees, even though it is super hot out right now, it's very, very weird. And uh, we're coming from Nebraska. I'm not born, I wasn't born there, I lived there for a couple years. And so I hope this doesn't offend anybody in here, but I kind of miss the snow. So we could please bring a little bit of snow, not too much, not too much because I know it get, get, get kind of crazy here, but just a little bit of snow, I would greatly, greatly appreciate that. But uh, again, we're in the Christmas season and we want to keep the focus on Jesus. And so this is a little embarrassing for me to admit, but when I was growing up, I thought when you see Jesus' name in the Bible, you see Christ come after that a lot of times, Jesus Christ, Jesus Christ. And so I thought that was his last name. I just thought, you know, he's Jesus and then Christ like Tyler Brown. I just thought that's how it flowed, but that's not true. Christ is a, a title. It might not mean as much to us today, but with the biblical writers, they knew what it meant. It meant he is a king. He is the Messiah. And they don't say that lightly. He's not just a king like King Herod was or the president of the country. Like he's not like just some other ruler. He is the king of the universe. Nothing that is here was made without him. Everything is being held together by him. He is the king of all, the king of kings and lord of lords. And that who is we, we get to worship this Sunday morning. So I want to ask you all to go ahead and stand back up as we sing praises to our king.
Thank you so much for worshiping the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords with us this morning. You can take your seats. What is up, everybody? How y'all doing today? What's up, what's up? Hey! What's up, students? How y'all doing? We have the students in here today as well, guys. Um, real quick, let's start off with some Merry Christmas. Can you turn to some people around you and just say, like, Merry Christmas and make it sound joyful? Awesome. Very good. So much encouragement and joy in the room. Um, let's try this one. Turn to somebody around you and say, Bah humbug. <laughs> nice. This is so funny. Um, first service, I was watching everybody do that. I look over here, and this lady was like, nope. And I was like, she refused to do it, like not in my household. So yeah, um, we're in a series right now. This is our Christmas series, and it's called Bah Humbug. Because like we know, if we're honest, right, the holiday season can be a little stressful. It can be very, very busy. It can get very expensive. And it can also be a little isolating, right? Sometimes we can step into the holidays instead of thinking like Merry Christmas and joy and everything. Sometimes we step into it with a little anxiety, a little worry, and maybe even a little fear. So in this series, what we want to do is we want to look at the original Christmas story and find places where we can find purpose, where we can find hope, and even today where we can find resilience. And it's been a really, really cool series so far. Um, the series is titled Bah Humbug, and this phrase was made popular in a Charles Dickens book called A Christmas Carol. Carol. Um, it was actually kind of cool. We had an edition of it recently at um, the play over the holiday kind of kickoff to the Christmas in Harborview. It was amazing. Mr. Jams was actually here in first service. I know he was here. It was amazing, right? <laughs> um, but it was super fun. But in the original story, it involves this older guy who's very rich and very isolated from his community. And he is visited by a handful of spirits over the course of a crazy night. He's visited by the, uh, the spirit of Christmas past, of uh, Christmas present, and Christmas future. And these spirits are able to show him who he has become, but also who he is becoming. And he didn't like who he was becoming. So over this night, he decides to change everything. And he goes from being this like bah humbug kind of person to becoming somebody who is actually very generous and kind someone who was actually willing to work with his community and come alongside them. And it's pretty amazing. I love the story, and it shows us that sometimes the biggest changes can happen in the most difficult situations. Something that we might consider a problem is actually something that could create some really positive and really encouraging change in our lives. And today we're looking at the original Christmas story, and we're looking at how Joseph, Jesus' earthly father, went through a similar situation. He was also visited by a spiritual being, and it's able to show him some things that were happening in his life and encourage him to find resilience and change so that God could shine through not just his relationship, but everything involved in that. And it was actually pretty exciting. When I was writing this message, I actually had to study the term resilience to make sure I understood what I should talk about. And before, I kind of assumed resilience and perseverance were very similar, almost like two different ways of saying the exact same thing. There's a problem. We want to push through the problem. Try as hard as you can. You have perseverance. You have resilience. Fight through the tough situation. When in reality, the two terms might be similar, but there's some really important differences between the two. Yes, perseverance is more about like just trying to push through something that is difficult and still trying to find success, but resilience is all about adapting and changing. If we think of perseverance being like a rock, that as long as you're strong enough, it'll smash through any problem, I want us to think of resilience almost like a lump of clay where the very purpose is to mold and change so that it can better fit whatever scenario it finds itself in. 
In fact, I have a definition of resilience for you today. So if you are taking notes through the Believer's app or on the paper that you got as you walked in, I would love for you to write this down, take notes, follow along with the message today, and share it with somebody else when we're done today as well. Resilience is this, though. It is the ability to recover or adapt after encountering adversity or change. So it's not about staying the same through the problem, but instead resilience is being willing to adapt and change because of whatever problem we find ourselves in. And as I was researching the idea of resilience, I found out that a ton of people are actually studying this as well. Um, as we as a culture and as a world went through the pandemic, a lot of companies had to adjust and change as they stepped back into trying to find some sense of new normal way of operating. So we found a lot of people studying which business leaders were doing good at being resilient and which ones were not doing so well, which businesses were able to step into the new way of doing things and find success, and why were the other ones struggling to make things work out. Um, the Harvard Business Review, they interviewed over 150 different business leaders that did this really well. They were able to come out of the pandemic and find success, even though everything had changed drastically. And they interviewed them, and this is what they found, and it's actually really, really interesting. They found this, resilience is not something we need to find deep down inside ourselves. We can actually become more resilient in the process of connecting with others in our most challenging times. So the business leaders that did well at changing and adapting weren't necessarily strong by themselves, but instead they had a strong team around them. Resilience has very little to do with how much I can accomplish on my own or how strong I can be but has everything to do with the team that I surround myself with. Have I surrounded myself with people that are encouraging and uplifting, that help me to find problems and work through them? Am I like a rock trying to smash through the issue or more like a lump of clay allowing others to mold me and change me? Resilience and the ones who actually were able to step out of it were willing to change. And as they dug in a little bit deeper and they were interviewing these leaders and asking them like, like some examples of resilience within your workplace, how does this show up on a daily basis? This is what they found. The strong team around them in resilience, it helps us to shift work or manage surges. So when life gets busy, are you able to move things around? Are you able to reprioritize or even change your schedule completely? The team around them helped them to manage that. How about this? It helps us to make sense of people or politics in a given situation. And this isn't like, why did this person vote for that person? Okay, it's not that kind of politics, but more so, why do people act the way that they act? Why is there drama over here? Why is that person mad? Wait, is this my fault or somebody else's fault? Resilience and a team around you can make sense of people, even within the workplace. Or how about this one? It helps us to find confidence, to push back and self-advocate, to stand up for yourself, to speak on an idea that you think is important, even though no one else might not understand what's going on, to be willing to say, look, this is something that I think is really important to me, and to be willing to actually advocate for yourself. Alone, that can be really tough, but a team around you can encourage and motivate and encourage you to do that. Or even this one, it helps us to see a path forward. When everything feels hopeless, a team around you will show you, no, there is a way, there is a path, there are possibilities even in this problem. Or this one, to provide empathic support so that we can release negative emotions. We feel a certain way. We don't know how to empathize with somebody else, so we hold on to it, and we stay angry, and, and that relationship is divided. But a team around us can support us and allow us to empathize with somebody else, letting go of the emotions that tend to divide. And this one is very important, to help us laugh at ourselves and the situation this one hurts in the moment, but it's so important, right? So many times in my own life, I look at a problem and I build it up to be something that is unrealistic and to have somebody to say, whoa, can we slow down a little bit and bring this in the context and actually maybe laugh at what's happening? I can't do that alone, but yo, a team will humble me. And this last one, to broaden us as individuals so that we can maintain perspective when setbacks happen, and they will happen. And this is crazy because each of these are written from within a workplace environment, but I promise you that at least one of these impacted every single person in this room today. 
And you can see the need for these in your own life or your household or the community here. I know there are so many times in my own life that I find myself wishing that I could understand the reason people act the way they act around me. Why is there drama? What is happening over here? Is this my fault? Is there something I could have done better? There are so many times in my own life where I wish that I could move things around and manage life better. In my household, things are very busy right now. We have ballet and karate, and there are days that I forget who's twirling and who's doing the hayas, and I got the wrong person in the wrong car, and it can be difficult to better manage our, our schedules, and to do that well, it takes a team. I wish I had the ability to empathize better. I do. I wish that I had the ability to, to speak up for myself without feeling so selfish all the time. I wish, I wish, and I wish. And maybe you're in a place where one of those spoke to you and you're like, yo, resilience is something I need. This is something I desperately want to do better at these things. Well, today, I'm gonna ask you to, to start off with some prayer and ask God to speak into your life and as we read the original Christmas story and we learn from the life of Joseph, I pray that God will show us what our problems are as well and to remind us that we were never meant to do this alone, but we were meant to do this as a community and work through this together. So would it be okay as we start today if I pray for you and start by asking God to be a part of this conversation and to be a part of how we process what we're reading and talking about today and allow us to change because of that. So let's pray together. God, we love you. And in this moment, we pray, God, that you will speak into our lives. God, you know what those problems are, the ones that we're facing, the ones that we're afraid of, the ones that we don't even want to talk about. God, you know what they are. And God, I pray that you will show us how we can change and adapt and mold ourselves so that we are better suited for whatever it is that, that we are facing in life. And God, remind us that we are never meant to do this alone, but we are meant to do this in community. So as we read um, your word today, God, and we seek your wisdom God, I pray that it will speak into our lives and impact us. And as we leave today, we can leave changed people. We love you. We pray all of this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So the main passage we're looking at today is found in Matthew chapter 1, and it's the original Christmas story written from a perspective that kind of really focuses on Joseph. Um, last week, Heather taught an amazing message, and she talked about Mary and how Mary found purpose in everything that she went through. And today, we're kind of really focusing on Joseph and the resilience that he was able to find as he worked through this really difficult situation. So again, if you're following along, we'd love for you to turn in your Bibles to Matthew chapter 1 starting in verse 18. It says this, this is how Jesus the Messiah was born. His mother, Mary, was engaged to be married to Joseph, but before the marriage took place, while she was still a virgin, she became pregnant through the power of the Holy Spirit. Joseph, to whom she was engaged, was a righteous man, and he did not want to disgrace her publicly, so he decided to break the engagement quietly. Now, as we're reading this, I think for us to understand the weight of what was on Joseph in this moment, we have to know the context and how different things were for them compared to the way engagements typically happen today. Like today, it's like you need a ring and a really romantic place to propose, right? Make sure it's memorable. Make sure it's not in sand so you don't threaten losing the ring. It's kind of easy, right? Back then, things were way more involved. Um, for them, they were quite young to get married. So Joseph probably would have been around 18 years old. Mary was probably around the age of 14. So all of this is placed on the shoulders of an 18-year-old, also trying to protect a 14-year-old. And this would have been really, really heavy. And again, it wasn't just them. Like These aren't just like high school sweethearts that decided to get together. This was an arranged marriage. Their families were heavily involved. There's a good chance they didn't even meet before the wedding. But the families were committed, and they were trying to join together and join the families in this union that would strengthen them entirely. So there's family commitment here. At the same time, there's a financial commitment. Um, so Joseph would have had to have paid like a bride price in order to marry Mary. I said that really fast first service, Mary, Mary, and everyone's like, what is happening? In order to marry Paul's Mary. Um, at the same time, Mary's family would have brought like a financial gift as well. So both families were bringing in a lot of financial stability into this. So we have this sense where there's a financial commitment, there's a family commitment, and there's also a cultural commitment. Um, to break the engagement would have been really difficult. Uh, a spouse would have to die or there would have had to have been some kind of infidelity. 
So Joseph, at the age of 18, is probably stepping into this with a lot of weight on his shoulders. This isn't just a decision for him, but this is a decision for his family and his community, and he's weighing all of that. Have you ever had to make a decision in life that you knew would affect you, but also would have life-changing effects of somebody else? How do you know which way to go in that? Do I fight for myself? Do I fight for this other person? Is it possible to do like a win-win situation here? I think as we live our lives, we realize the win-win scenario doesn't really happen as often as we would like. Have you ever had to make a decision, though, and you knew you were going to upset somebody? You knew it was impossible to please all parties. Family would be upset. The people in your community would be upset. Somebody was bound to get upset. And maybe the decision you're making might actually lead to having more difficulty placed on somebody else. Joseph is struggling with all of that. And I can only imagine what he was probably going through, feeling the pressure from family and culture and not knowing what to do. And he's trying to do his best. It says he was a righteous man. He knew God. He loves God. And he wants to do everything he can to protect himself, but also protect Mary. But then the story continues, and in verse 20, it says this. As he considered this, so he's wrestling with this idea, should I go this way or that way? As he considered this, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream. Joseph, son of David, the angel said, do not be afraid to take Mary as your wife, for the child within her was conceived by the Holy Spirit, and she will have a son, and you are to name him Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins." The angel tells him, do not be afraid to take Mary as your wife. And think about what the angel just told him. Think about the fears of being a father. I mean, being a father is hard enough already, right? And the angel just said, oh, by the way, your son's going to be the one who takes away the sins of his people. Joseph is a smart dude. He knows God. He's connecting the dots. He's like, wait a second. Only God can forgive sins. Wait, what are you saying right now? Can you imagine the pressure and the burden placed on this young father? It's already difficult enough, and now your son is going to be God in the flesh. But I don't think the angel is telling him, don't be afraid of being a dad. The angel says, don't be afraid of taking Mary as your wife. And in this moment, it's as if the angel is saying, Joseph, you're going to step into this relationship, and it's not going to be easy for you. There's going to be a lot of cultural baggage that comes with doing this. There's going to be shame that others try to place on Mary. There's going to be gossip in the streets as people start doing the math, and they realize, yo, this baby didn't happen on the wedding night. As people start realizing this has happened, Joseph, this is not just a burden that Mary has to carry. If you decide to do this, Joseph, this is your burden as well. Do not be afraid to make that decision. And Joseph is presented with this problem, and he doesn't allow the stress and the worry and the insecurities to stand in the way of what God is asking him to do. He looks at the problem, and he has shown possibilities. Through this, Jesus will take away the sins of his people. Joseph, this is way bigger than you understand. He sees the possibilities even in the problem. I love what Warren Wiersbe says. He was quoted saying this, if we see only the problems, we will be defeated. But if we see the possibilities in the problems, we can have victory. If we only look at the problems, we will be defeated every single time. But if we allow ourselves to see the possibilities, even in the most difficult of problems, we can find victory. And I can imagine this is probably what Joseph is wrestling with. This is what we wrestle with even today, finding the possibilities and the problem. And we can read this and say, that sounds really cool. But when we try to live it out, it's quite a bit more difficult, isn't it? Real quick, how many of you in the room would you say, I'm kind of like a glass half full kind of person? You would consider yourself an optimist. Any optimists in the room? That's amazing. Real quick, if you're an optimist, turn to the person next to you and say, look at the possibilities. (laughs) Oh, so much excitement, right? There was excitement in that. I could feel it. I'm encouraged being up here. Now, Now, real quick. This is cool. How many of you in the room are the exact opposite? Like the glass is always half empty. You're a pessimist. You might consider yourself a realist, but you're a pessimist. Real quick, turn to the person next to you and say, what possibilities? What possibilities? Now this is huge, okay? 
Because there's a good chance that all of us are some level of optimist, pessimist, depending on what we're going through. But real quick, if you tend to look at things as like the glass is half empty, I'm the pessimist. Can I speak directly to you really quick? Because I know for you, it might be difficult to listen to this and actually do it. Maybe in your life, all you see are problems and the possibility in the problems seems impossible. It's almost like wishful thinking, right? It would be cool if that happened, but it ain't gonna happen. If we only focus on the problems, it can lead to isolation, it can lead to despair, it can lead to anxiety and depression. If you find yourself processing things like this, there are only problems, it's really tough to see the possibilities. Would you allow somebody to speak into your life even this week? Would you allow somebody to get close enough and share with them what that problem might be so they can encourage you, so that they can help you dream so that they can help you see something that maybe it is impossible for you to see, they can help you to find the possibilities that are right there. This is a person who would be willing to step into your life and have hope in you even when you don't have hope in yourself. It's someone who's willing to say, I got you, we're gonna go through this together. And if you're the optimist, you might be thinking, Doug, I got this, I'll see you next week, buds. <laughs> but it, I, this is how I am, I'm like a hopeless optimist. And if you're like me, I think sometimes we can set up really unrealistic expectations. I can say, cool, here's a problem, and I can barely even see the problem. Look at all these possibilities, and I really want this one to happen, and I really want this one to happen so much, I convince myself it will happen, and when it doesn't happen, I get really upset, and I feel let down, and I get angry at others, and I get angry at God. And what I need in my life, and if you're like me, maybe you need this too. We need somebody. We need a realist. We need somebody to help us keep our feet on the ground, to help us see what is actually possible, what is realistic, not to change the way that we think, but to help us understand what God might be actually doing. This isn't what I want. This is what God wants in my life. This is somebody who's willing to step into your life and say, I'm going to help you walk through your moment of suffering instead of simply saying, I told you so. You should act like I act. No possibilities. <laughs> the truth is we all need somebody like this. We need somebody to encourage us right where we are. We need somebody who can open up our eyes and see the thing that is unseen, to see the possibility even in the problem. And can I ask you a question real quick? What is your problem? What is the problem you're facing right now wherever you're at in life? Is there a relationship that maybe you are on the verge of giving up on? And you're thinking to yourself, there's no way this could work out. Is there a prayer that you've been praying over and over and over again and you've lost hope? And maybe you still pray it, but you just pray it just because it's routine. Maybe you don't really believe that God hears and God wants to work through that. Maybe there's a change in your life right now that you're avoiding because you know it would be so incredibly difficult. You'd rather not deal with it. So you keep living the status quo. What is the problem you're facing right now? And what are the possibilities even in that problem? Would you let somebody close enough to speak? Would you let God speak into your life, maybe even this week? I love what Paul writes as he tries to write to one of the early churches in Corinth. He knows the early church is going through some pretty difficult problems as well. He's trying to encourage them the same way I'm trying to encourage you today. And Paul writes this, and it's actually kind of cool because it connects to the first Christmas story as well. Paul writes in 2 Corinthians Chapter 4, starting in verse 7, he says, Look, we now have this light shining in our hearts, but we ourselves are like fragile clay jars containing this great treasure. This makes it clear that our great power is from God and not from ourselves. I can imagine Joseph feeling this way right here, looking at his life and everything feeling like it's out of control feeling like this fragile clay jar. Man, I've planned, I've prepared, and now everything is changing. What can I actually accomplish? But realizing that God is still shining through, that the glory is not his own, but the glory will be because God is intervening in that situation. This has to be the way that Joseph is feeling. And for a lot of us, this is the way that we feel all the time. And Paul continues, and he says this, he says, we are pressed on every side by troubles, but we are not crushed. We are pressed on every side by troubles, but we are not crushed. Have you ever heard the phrase, when it rains, it pours? When one problem shows up in your life, it brings a dozen other ones, right? And sometimes they're not even connected. You're like, wait a second, how is this even happening? 
Sometimes we feel pressed down on all sides with the problems that we're facing. But Paul says we are not crushed because Paul looks at the problem and he's looking for the possibilities in the problem. When we find ourselves in that place, we have to rely on each other. We have to share each other's burdens. We have to be there for one another. And Paul is saying that we can do this together. We're not alone in this. The possibilities are we can rely on someone else who is so very close who can help you to work through that. Here at Believers, we do something at the very end of the year, and we call it the gift. And for us, it's an amazing opportunity to be generous in giving and to help others who might feel like this pressed down on all sides with the problems that they are facing in life. And some of them feel like we are being crushed and they might feel hopeless. As a church, we want to collect and give and give back to the person who feels like there is no hope to show them, yes, we might feel pressed in on all sides, but can we help you share this burden? Can we come alongside you? Can we show you the possibilities that might work even in this difficult situation? It's an amazing opportunity for us as a church to help individuals and families and organizations in our community and maybe even within our church to show them the love of Jesus. Pastor Tyler is going to come out at the end of the message. He's going to give us more details on how we can be a part of the gift and what it looks like and some of the opportunities we have to help. We want to do what Paul is saying right here. But he doesn't end with just the pressed on every side. He continues and he says, and guess what? We're perplexed. Actually, back one slide if we could. There we go. Thank you so much. Um, we are perplexed, but we are not driven to despair. Perplexed. Joseph had to have felt perplexed, right? The angel tells him what's happening and none of it makes any sense. He's like, wait a second. You're telling me what? Have you ever felt so doubtful, so insecure, so worried that nothing in life made sense? But again, we're not driven to despair because there are possibilities even in that problem. We know that we can rely on God's word. We know that we can trust God's wisdom. And it's in those moments where we don't have answers that we need to seek answers that are beyond just our own understanding. And the possibilities there are we dig into God's word and we study and we learn and we learn how to apply that to our own lives. Paul says, we are hunted but never abandoned. And we can read that and assume that's figurative language, Paul. But no, he's like literal. We are being hunted, persecuted because of our faith. There were people trying to stop them from meeting, stop them from worshiping. And he says, even in that moment when they arrest him and when they throw him in prison, he is not alone, alone in a jail cell, but not alone because God is still there. At your lowest moment, when you feel like no one else is there for you, God is close. And God is willing to help and God is willing to encourage and comfort. And Paul is saying that is possible because there are possibilities in the problem. And we get knocked down, but we are not destroyed. We get knocked down. Life be like that, right? We get knocked down, but we're not destroyed. Because every step of the way, when we feel pressed in, when we feel like we are perplexed, when we feel like we are abandoned, we feel these ways, but we know we are being molded and changed. So we're not destroyed. We're just being changed into something that looks different. And I think all of that means what Paul says next in verse 10 can actually make sense. And he says this, through suffering... Our bodies continue to share in the death of Jesus so that the life of Jesus may also be seen in our bodies. The suffering and the problems and the issues, the very things that we try to avoid, could it be these are the things that are molding us and changing us into something that looks more and more like Jesus every difficult situation we find ourselves in? Instead of avoiding these things, what if we simply embraced them and found the possibilities even in the most difficult problem knowing that through that Jesus will shine through? I love what Elias Fitzpatrick says. They said this, maturity in, Christ, or maturity in the Christian life is measured by only one test. How much closer to his character have we become? All of this is the maturing process of a follower of Jesus, molded and changed, adapting to whatever problem might come out, whatever moment we might feel pressed in or crushed or abandoned, it's a chance for us to be more like Jesus. Could it be that that is the outcome that we should desire? We see Joseph continuing in this mindset as well. 
as we continue reading this original Christmas story. In verse 22, it says this, All of this occurred to fulfill the Lord's message through his prophet. Look, the virgin will conceive a child. She will give birth to a son, and they will call him Emmanuel, which means God is with us. When Joseph woke up from like the craziest dream ever, am I right? He wakes up, and he, and he did as the angel of the Lord commanded, and he took Mary as his wife. But he did not have sexual relations with her until her son was born, and Joseph named him Jesus. I love this part here, this prophecy showing Joseph, man, this problem seems overwhelming to you, but this thing has been predicted long ago. Joseph, you are a part of a bigger story, meaning this is not just your burden to carry. It's your burden, but also also the burden that Mary has to carry. And it's also the burden that your families have to carry. And it's the burden that your community is going to carry with you. Joseph, this is not just your problem. So this is not something that you have to carry alone. And I really do think that is the the main point of resilience, not trying to do it myself, but realizing that through this moment, whatever that problem might be, God is working through me so that I can rely on others and so that we can help each other and carry each other's burdens as well. At the very beginning of our talk today, we shared what the Harvard Business Review found about resilience. Resilience is not something we need to find deep down inside of ourselves we can actually become more resilient in the process of connecting with others and our most challenging times. And Paul agrees with this, right? Like the verse we just read, look how many times Paul says the word we. He says, we are pressed on every side by troubles, but we are not crushed. We are perplexed, but not driven to despair. We are hunted down, but never abandoned by God. We get knocked down, but we are not destroyed. At no point in this passage does Paul say, this is your problem alone. At no point in this passage does he say, this is something you carry, figure it out. The whole way he's saying, this is something we do together. So your problem is not your problem. It's our problem. It's the person next to you. It's mine. It's all of us together as we try to live life with each other, trying to find out the best way of working through whatever the problem and situation you find yourself in today. So I ask again, what is your problem? What is that relationship that you're worried about? What is that prayer that you've lost hope on? What is that change in your life that you avoid because you're afraid? And this week, would you be willing to let somebody close enough to help? Would you be willing to let God speak into your life and give direction and guidance? And if you feel perplexed, if you feel pressed down, if you feel persecuted, if you feel like you keep tripping up and maybe even feel destroyed, maybe this week we learn what resilience actually means and it's not doing it alone. I was really trying to find a good big idea for today and I couldn't make it better than what Warren Wearsby said. So I'm going to take the easy way out, and I'm just going to make the big idea a quote. So our big idea today is this. If we see only the problems, we will be defeated. But if we see the possibilities in the problems, we can have victory. And I believe there's some next steps that we can all take together as we process this idea of resilience. Maybe today your next step is you are ready to become a follower of Jesus for the very first time. And hearing this, you're ready to follow him. You're ready to dedicate your life to him. Um, And as a church family, we want to celebrate that. We want to come alongside you in that. And just like everything we talked about today, this is not something you are meant to do alone, but it's something we're meant to do together. So if that's where you're at today, we would love to know about it. You can check the block on your communication card or the communication card in the Believer's app. And we would love to follow up with you even this week about some ways that we can um, just help you know what that means to follow Jesus in this way. But the next one is also really important. We're going to ask you to memorize John 12, 46. It's the key verse for our series. It helps us to stay in the Christmas mindset and get excited about what God is doing through us here um, as we continue to do good in the community as well. On the next one, it says this, if you feel perplexed or crushed, trust God's word and others in your life. If you feel like you're perplexed, like we all feel all the time, right? Or crushed or pressed in, would you be willing to trust God's word and somebody else in your life, even this week? And closing out as the last one, to help us change the life of someone else by giving to the gift. And again, Pastor Tyler is going to come out in one second and tell us how we can do that. 
But would it be okay if we close out in a word of prayer and I pray over you and whatever that problem is that you're facing today and challenge you to find a sense of resilience, not in yourself, but in the community around you. Let's pray together. God, we love you so much. We thank you for this moment, um, this moment where we are challenged to put into practice what your word and what your wisdom says, that we aren't supposed to do this alone, that we need to trust others in our lives. And this is more than just like a business practice, right? This is a, a life decision that we can make um, to trust that person who knows what our problem is, to allow them to inspire and encourage us or even allow them to keep our feet on the ground and find realistic solutions. God, whatever it might be, I pray that this week we can do that and help us to find that sense of resilience, trusting in you and also relying on each other as well. And God, if there's anybody in the room today who is ready to place their faith in you for the first time, I pray that this week you will just show them your love and forgiveness. Surround them with a sense of purpose and hope and resilience as well. And as a church, I pray that we can come alongside them on this faith journey and help them know what it means to be a follower of you. So God, we lift all these things up to you. And we're so very excited about the series and what you're doing. And I pray, God, that you will take us from a mindset of bah humbug to a mindset of joy and happiness and peace as we embrace this holiday season for you. God, we love you so much. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen, amen, amen. Thank you so much, Doug. Um, and it's really cool how you focus on Joseph for that because sometimes he can be forgotten. Because, man, to be put in a situation like that, I just, oh, my, I, to think this woman's pregnant, I didn't do this. Are you gonna, she going to tell me it's from God? Like, that whole situation is just wild and crazy. But thank God that he chose to do it that way through them. And uh, as Doug said, I want to let you all know about a way you can, in this Ball Humbug se sermon series, that we can be generous in how we can help the community that is around us. And before I do that, though, I want to tell you different ways that you can give here is through the Believer's Church app, through the website, or dropping a gift off on your way out. And so for everyone who calls Believer's Church your home, we teach the tithe. The 10% of what comes in goes to God. And that's how one way that we choose to worship God with our finances. And then, though, with the gift specifically, it is a giving initiative that we do in the Christmas season that we've been doing for 20 years here. There have been so many people who have been blessed by people who have given generously to the gift. And so... I want to let you know a couple ways that we are going to use the funds that come in for this initiative. So one, we're giving money to a church called Mosaico in Nashville that is heavily involved in the immigrant population that is there. And that money will go toward care packages for people who come to this country with absolutely nothing. And so that's going to be huge for them in that church. We're also going to be giving money to schools in this area that is going to be different initiatives that are going on. I can't remember every single one of them, but I think it's four schools, four initiatives. And so money will be going to that as well. And also with camp this year, where if you don't know this, 90% of people who trust Jesus, trust him between the ages of four and 14. And so it's a huge thing that they go to camp and the money that will be given to camp for this year from the gift will help to keep the cost of camp the, similar to what it was in the past years because it's gotten very, very expensive. And so that gift money will be going to that as well. And so if you use one of these methods, please make sure you designate money for the gift if that is what you are giving it for because all the money given to the gift will go to all of those initiatives. And so we truly appreciate your participation in that and uh, ushers in the room, you can go ahead and pass the buckets around now. And so we also have one way that you can plug in easily by checking in. And you can do that by using the hashtag be love to caps. That is Coalition Against Poverty in Suffolk, a phenomenal organization that does so much tackling the problem of homelessness in our specific in our, our backyard. And so it's a great organization. You can check in on Facebook and that allows us to give above and beyond what we already do to that fantastic organization. And last but not least, we're still in Christmas in Harborview around here. And even though we just had jams, which was an amazing, amazing play, I, I hope you were able to see it. And sorry if you missed it. It will be back around next year. But we have uh, on Christmas Eve Eve, so the 23rd, we have two services at 4.30 and 6 p.m. And then on the 24th, we have one service at 10 a.m. in the morning. We would love to have you there. So if you please could invite somebody. It's a super, super easy invite to invite somebody to a Christmas service. And so we would love to have you do that. And so with all that being said, I want to ask y'all to go be love 
and have a great week.